are still in the book of Amos, and I already said it, but Amos is a patriot. He loves his country. Any patriots here? Do we love our country? Yeah, I think we're all patriots. And uh, Amos is struggling because the nation he loves is kind of out of whack, and he knows it. And he is struggling, and as we look in this chapter in Amos, he's struggling with the Lord. He's got to struggle with the Lord, and it's kind of like, why are you letting this happen? It's kind of like, why is my preaching in vain? I'm preaching and nothing is happening, nothing is changing, everybody's staying the same, they're not hearkening and listening to me. He's been preaching about his nation from the very beginning of the book all the way here into the seventh chapter. He's preaching and he's struggling with the Lord. He's struggling basically at this point with what he saw. The Lord showed him something. In chapter 7, verse 1, he says, this is what the sovereign Lord showed me. And so I got him kind of like peeling back uh, the page here and he's getting a glimpse uh, and seeing uh, something that the Lord showed him. And what he, he, he shows him, he struggles with. He was preparing a swarm of locusts after the king's share had been harvested. So the king got his crop. Of course, that's the way it worked. He took the top. It's kind of like, I always love this, when a, a young teen gets their first job and they've been calculating all the money they're going to make. And then they get their paycheck, and there's all this money that they earned that is missing because the king took his part first, Uncle Sam, right? Isn't that the way it works? And they are shocked, and we just say, uh, get used to it, because it's probably not going down, it's only going to go up. Uh, what they take, I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. After the king got his portion, it says he was preparing a swarm of locusts after the king's share had been harvested, just as the second crop was coming up when they stripped the land clean. And I cried out, Sovereign Lord, forgive. How can Jacob survive? He is so small. I don't know why in this vision the Lord is showing Amos that the king, and he's a wicked king, he gets his share while the people don't get their share. But he does. And it's at this point that Amos cries out, Sovereign Lord, forgive. How can Jacob survive? He is so small. So the Lord relented. This will not happen, the Lord said. Nope, this won't happen. Whew. Aren't you glad Amos prayed? They're glad Amos prayed. Wow. But right behind that, the Lord shows him another vision. This is what he sees. And he's struggling with the Lord because of what he has seen. This is what the sovereign Lord showed me. The sovereign Lord was calling for judgment by fire. That does not sound good. It dried up the great deep and it devoured the land. So this fire, it's causing a drought. There is no water. He's, he's licking, this fire is licking up all the water so the crops are all going to die. This is no better than the previous one. And then I cried, Sovereign Lord. You know what that means? The Lord is in absolute control of everything. Sovereign Lord, I beg you, Stop! How can Jacob survive? He is so small. And so we get this. And so the Lord relented. This will not happen, the sovereign Lord said. Wow. I'm really glad he prayed, aren't you? He prayed and the sovereign Lord answered. I want you to notice something here. Prayer does matter. So the Lord relented. So the Lord relented. 
The Lord did not do what he showed him he was going to do. The Lord relented. We wield the most powerful tool of anything in any arsenal, in any warfare, in any spiritual battle, and it's just simply prayer. Prayer matters. That's why in uh, uh, 2 Chronicles 7.14 it says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Seek my face. Turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins. I will relent and will heal their land. Isn't that amazing? We need to pray for the good old USA, right? We do. We do. We need to pray for our nation. Then there's a third vision. This is what the sovereign Lord showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb. It's a perfectly straight wall. Isn't that the kind you want in your house? We have a house that didn't have a perfectly straight wall on the back side of it. It was caving in. And so uh, they brought in and dug out behind it and put reinforcement in it and beams and steel. It's stronger now than it would ever be. Later then, though, because it had been leaning for such a long time, the brick was out of whack, and so we had to have somebody come out and take down all the brick. Put this little uh, metal piece down. I'm little. It's big stick. And restack the brick back on it. That wall, I think right now the rest of the house will fall down, but that wall will stand. <laughs> Because it had to be true to the plumb. Because if it is not true to the plumb line, it will over time collapse and fall. The Lord, he sees the Lord, okay? And he's got, he's got this plumb line. It's like he's on top of the wall, and he's dropping the plumb line down, and the wall is perfectly plumb. It's a good wall. That's a good wall. Then the Lord said, <clears throat> ask me. He said, hey, Amos, what do you see? And Amos responds, a plumb line, I replied. And then we find, then the Lord said, look, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel, and I will spare them no longer. What? He's saying, this is really not about a wall. This is about dropping a plumb line of my righteousness and my holiness, and we'll see if the nation is standing in line or if they are tilting out of kilter. And that plumb line, folks, is the Word of God. The Word of God is our plumb line. When I read the Word, the Word speaks. You see, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture is God-breathed. It is the Word of God. God's word is true. Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The Bible is the truth. It is the plumb line. And if I am not in line with the word, I am out of plumb. I'm ready to collapse. I will fall. The nation, that's what he has here, Israel, the nation, was not true to the plumb line of God's word. And they were going to fall. Economically, they'd been doing great. The wealthy were living lavishly. The king, he got his full crop. But that plumb line dropped, and the people were idolatrous. They were wicked. They were worshiping Molech, who were sacrificing their children. There's all kinds of evils going on. They were out of plumb, and he said, I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed. Isaac, that was the founding father, right? Uh, Jacob, Isaac, Abraham, the founding patriarchs. Listen, he said, I will destroy, the high places will be destroyed, and the sanctuary of Israel will be in ruin by, the, by my sword. I will bring against the house of Jeroboam. Jeroboam had expanded the borders of Israel, probably to the largest they'd been since Solomon, maybe even beyond. And so he has a big territory, big kingdom, but so what? 
when the hand of the Lord is against you, even though you are like the biggest guy on the block at the time, even if you're as big as the United States of America, if you abandon God, we are in big, big trouble. The plumb line is God's holiness and his righteousness, all according to his word. His word. The word of God. I said, prayer does matter, right? I said that. Because two times he said the Lord relented. This third time, though, there's no prayer. There's no prayer. There's no relenting. It's almost as if he knows what will be spoken a generation or so later to Jeremiah, where Jeremiah is told by God three times in the book of Jeremiah, do not pray for my people. Whoa. I am not going to relent. I'm not going to forgive. I am not going. Listen, they have gone over the edge. They are going to be judged for their wickedness and their sinfulness. You see, there's a key here. The Lord, the prayer does matter. Prayer matters so much. But listen to all of the verse. If my people who are called by my name, we call ourselves by the name of the Lord, Christians, if we will humble ourselves, get down our knees and pray. How do we do that? We seek the face of the Lord. We're searching for him. Lord, Lord, I want to find you. And we do that by turning from our wicked ways. There's the catch. In Amos' day, they were not turning from their wicked ways. They kept praying, forgive us, forgive us, but they never turned from their wicked ways. They continued in their idolatry. They continued resisting God. They continued to offer their children. They continued to oppose God. And when they get in a jam, they pray. But when we turn from our wicked ways, it's called repent. Then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and will heal their land. Wow. Prayer is powerful. When we humble ourselves, seek his face, and turn from our wicked ways. As a nation, we have things we need to turn from. But I go back to where God put the burden of this vision on the people and not those who are at the top. The people, all right, we're going to experience this great drought, the locust plague, the lack of food. But those at the top had already had it. Why? I think it starts at the grassroots. It's not me poking somebody next to me. Boy, you sure need to repent. Boy, that message is really good for so-and-so in the audience today. I'm sure glad they're here. No, God is speaking to me. My heart. What needs to be changed there? How I need to put the Lord first. When we get a nation of people whose hearts are changed towards God, we will see the manifold blessing of God. There's no doubt. He will heal the land. Not only was he struggling with the patriotism of his, of his nation uh, and that their patriotism, because he, he's a patriot, he loves God, he loves his country, but his country's out of whack and he's been preaching against the politics of the day all the way through this book. He's been preaching uh, against that, but he's also struggling with the authorities. There's the king, there's the priest, there, there, there's the people. He's, he's dealing with these people. Remember, he is the outsider who's come on into the inside. He's from the southern kingdom of Judah, and he's gone to the northern kingdom of Israel, and he is preaching there about their sins and that they need to change, they need to repent, and they need to turn their hearts towards God. So he's the outsider, and he's struggling because They really don't want him there. I see that from the priestly's complaint. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel. Bethel was a a place uh, of worship for the northern kingdom. When the kingdoms divided, the southern kingdom had Jerusalem, and so they had the temple of God. Well, when the king of the north had split from the king of the south, he knew that if The Jews in the north were to follow the law. They'd go down to Jerusalem and worship there, and soon they'd be back 
with Judah instead of with his kingdom. So he set up two places of worship, one at Bethel and one in Dan, and he made a golden calf and said, this is Je Jehovah who led you out of Egypt. And they worshiped an idolatrous form of, of the, the Jewish faith. This guy is the priest at Bethel. Amaziah, priest at Bethel. He sent a message to Jeroboam, the king of Israel. So he sends a message to the king, and he's complaining, and he's complaining about, you guessed it, Amos, who's the preacher who's preaching. Preachers take a lot of flack, don't they? And they're, they're just the spokesperson for God. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you, O King Jeroboam. He's a, a conspiracy, and it's right here in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all of this. He's calling for a conspiracy. You ever watch the news these days? I don't care if you're on CNN. They talk about all the right-wing conspiracies. If you're on Fox, they talk about all the left-wing conspiracy. Conspiracy, conspiracy. Everywhere is a conspiracy. And it seems to work. It worked back then, and they try to work it today. Folks, just stay with the facts. Just stay with the facts. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you. Well, he wasn't really trying to raise a conspiracy against the king. He's just trying to point out your sins. We're sinning. We're sinning against God. If we don't change our way, judgment's coming. We, we, we need to trust in the Lord. We need to get back on track. Now, if you take that as a conspiracy, then I'm a conspirator too. Right? Because that's my call. Forsake your sin, come to Christ. He will forgive you. He'll give you life. He'll give you freedom like you've never had before. For it's for freedom that he set us free. Charge of conspiracy, the second one is a charge that we cannot bear his words. You know what that is? This is the seed of cancel culture. They just didn't call it back then. Back then they didn't call it that. We got to shut this guy up. We've got to shut this guy down. In fact, that's what's going to go on here. For this is what Amos is saying. Now he's going to tell us exactly. Jeroboam will die by the sword. Now I don't know if Amos actually said that. He may have because the Syrians are coming. Or is he a little hyperbole here? Is he uh, over-exaggerating? Is he embellishing the sermons that uh, Amos has been preaching? Because he said, hey, listen, if you don't, you're ripe for judgment. Jeroboam will die by the sword. Israel will surely go into exile. He has said that. He has said that. If you don't repent, exile is coming. You'll be away from your native land. And so, he's kind of like a tattletale. The priest is, uh, it'd be like somebody today going to President Biden and saying, have you heard that preacher Dennis Henderson down there at Bethany? He said, you're going to be in big trouble because you signed an executive order that pays for abortion in other countries now too. Judgment is coming. Folks, judgment is coming for that. Can you imagine that going on? Can you imagine that going on? That is what's going on in his day. The accusation is brought against the prophet. So here's what he says. Amaziah said to Amos, he's complained to the, the king and now he's really bold. He says, get out, you seer. Get out, you seer. A seer, that, that's a term for a prophet. Because the means by which God spoke to the prophet was also often he gave him a vision or a dream, and they called that a seeing. You're seeing something. You're actually seeing it play out. And so in this passage, uh, he saw the locust plague. He saw the fire. He saw the plumb line, okay? Now, these were in visions. These were in visions. And so he calls him a seer. Get out. The first thing they want to do is get out of here. We're going to shut you down. If we can't shut you out, we're going we're to get you out. He says, go back to the land of Judah. Go back from, to where you came from. We've had enough of your political preaching, because that's exactly what he was doing. He was preaching about the nation 
as a political entity getting back on track with God. He says, go back to the land where you've earned your bread there, do your prophesying there. We don't want you around here. Bug off, buddy. In fact, he said, don't prophesy anymore at Bethel. We'll find ourselves a different prophet. This often happened in the Old Testament. If you read the Old Testament, you know. When they didn't like the real prophet, like Jeremiah, Jeremiah, they threw him in a cistern in a well because he was preaching the word of God, and the word of God makes us feel uncomfortable. It does. And so what did they do? They rounded up false prophets that would say the things they wanted to hear. And that's exactly what it's, Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel. Because this is the king's sanctuary. It belongs to Jeroboam, not you. This is not your turf. Go back down to Jerusalem. And the temple is, is the temple of our kingdom, not your kingdom. Get out of here. Go back home. Wow. So the prophet responds. Amos, answer Amaziah, this priest. And he says, I was neither a prophet nor the, the prophet's son. But I was a shepherd. <laughs> That's what I was. I was a shepherd. He said, oh, and I was also a fig picker. I took care of sycamore fig trees. I was a fig picker. That's what I was. But then one day God called me. The Lord took me. He grabbed hold of me. I was eight years old when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. It wasn't long after that I realized God wanted me to be a preacher. I was just a child. I rebelled against that thought. I did not want to do that. Kind of, sort of did. Kind of, sort of didn't. The older I got, the more I didn't want to. You know how that works. I thought if I was a preacher, just think of all the things in the world you have to give up to be a preacher. No. Okay? I kind of liked it because I can remember at vacation Bible school, and we had a, a closing program. I volunteered for every single part. I'm glad they didn't give them all to me because they had a hard, hard time memorizing the ones they did give me. I wanted to, you know, I had that tension inside. I wanted it and I didn't want it. And it, you know, it had been easy for somebody to say, oh no, you don't want to be a preacher. He told me all the woes of the ministry. I tell, I tell people this when they say, well, I think, uh, they think they, maybe, maybe God's calling them to be a preacher. My, my response is that of which godly men before me have said, if you can do anything else on this planet and enjoy it, go do it. This is not something you volunteered to do. This is something God calls you to do. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. You're going to have those who don't like you and, and they will ridicule you and despise you. You're going to have those who are going to challenge you. You're going to have those who are going to say evil, wicked things about you. You're going to have people who will misunderstand you. You're going to, he said, listen, if you can do anything else, you go do it. Go do it. Because God's got to call you to this. Listen, he said, that's what he said. The Lord took me. He called me. He laid his hands on me. He grabbed me. He took me out of that job. And he said, I want you to go tend the flock. He said, I took you away from that flock. You're going to go tend my flock. He says, go and prophesy to my people Israel. Go. So he calls us. He sends us. And then he tells us exactly what he wants his people to do. Prophesy to the people. Tell them, I'm going to put my words in your mouth you are nothing more than a spokesperson. You're a conduit. You take my message and you share it to the people so that the people hear the word of the Lord. I see myself in that same function, not as a prophet, but as a preacher. I take the word of God, the Bible, and I lay it out before you, and I try to make relevant practical applications to it so that we conform to the plumb line of God's word in our daily lives. Now, I can't make you do that. But I have to preach that. I have to preach that. Like Amos. Like Amos. 
who took him from all that. Now then, hear the word of the Lord. You say, this is Amos now saying to him, do not prophesy against Israel and stop preaching against the house of Isaac. <clears throat> Amos was not the first one to be told not to preach or what to preach. Remember Moses? Moses, uh, he had to go to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh finally said, get out of my presence and don't you ever come back. Whew. That is not a good thing to say to the man of God. Because when he left, the next plague came, cost him his son. Whoa. How about uh, Elijah, Ahab the king? He tried to change what he preached. How about David with Nathan? Nathan the prophet had to go in front of him and tell him, you are the man. That was not a popular thing to do. How about John the Baptist? John the Baptist went before Herod and said, you have taken your brother's wife. Well, they divorced, but they divorced in order so he could take his brother's wife. And it cost him his head. How about Peter? Peter's preaching about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ and that God rose him from the dead and he's accusing the leaders in Jerusalem of being the guilty party. Now, that's not a very popular thing to do. They imprison him, but you know how it works. God releases them, and when they prison him one time, God opens the doors, and he lets them out. And My goodness. That kind of thing still goes on. How many remember the civil rights? Martin Luther King Jr. When he was preaching an unpopular message that may have cost him his life. Right? It's still viable today. It's still going to happen. Revelation tells us that in the future, two witnesses are going to be preaching in Jerusalem, and they are going to kill them for their testimony and witness because the, the beast or the Antichrist, he is not going to tolerate that. He rejoices that they die, and then they're resurrected, and they ascend into heaven, and it blows them away. Woo. Listen, this is just the way it is. When you are preaching the truth of the word of God, people want to shut you down. They do. Because the gospel is an offense. The offense is simply this. You are a sinner. Nobody wants to be called a sinner. You need a savior. Jesus is the only savior in the world. Boy, you are bigoted and narrow-minded. Can't you broaden your message? No. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Except you repent and believe in him, you are going to perish. That is not a popular position. That is the biblical position. It's the position of the prophets. There are consequences for rejecting the preacher who's preaching the message that God has given him. And the consequences are pretty severe. They start with Amaziah. He says, therefore, therefore, because you are saying all of this and doing all of this, you're contrary to the word of God. He said, therefore, this is what the Lord says, your wife will become a prostitute in the city. Oh, whoa. That's pretty rough. I jump ahead a little bit and I'll tell you why that happens. The invading army, the Assyrians come in, they capture Amaziah and they carry him into captivity. His wife is still left in the city. What's her livelihood? Her only livelihood in a pagan country is taking everything from her. The Assyrians, is she's in a desperate situation, and she has to turn to that which is the oldest profession in the world. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city. He's got marital problems, marital consequences. He's got consequences that affect his children for his disobedience to the preaching of the word of God by the man of God. Your son and your daughters will fall by the sword. Whoa, that's horrible. Later, King Zedekiah of the southern kingdom, he refuses to obey the word of the Lord just like uh, uh, Jeroboam here is doing. And Zedekiah uh, sees his sons murdered and then they put out his eyes. So the very last thing that he ever saw was his children being 
He says, your land will be measured and divided. It's going to be cut up. He's going to take your possessions, and they're going to take them from you, your land, all that you possess, and they're going to divide it up and give it to the Assyrians or to whoever they want. You'll have no control over anything that you own. That's terrible. And you yourself will die in a pagan country. You're you're going to be carried away in a foreign land. That's where you will die. There's consequences for resisting the word of the Lord. And Israel will certainly go into exile. There's little Israel, tiny little green spot on the map. That's the northern kingdom, Israel. And the, the purple is the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians... When they went in, they conquered, they took the population and they deported them and transplanted them in another region. They took Gentiles from another region and transported them and transplanted them into the northern kingdom. And those that intermingled with the Jews that were left there became known as the Samaritans. The Samaritans. It's struggling with these authority, all because they would not hear the word of the preacher. If they had heeded the words of the preacher, the nation would have repented. The leaders would have repented. All of this would have changed. God would have heard their prayer because they'd humbled themselves and they prayed and they sought the face of the Lord and they turned from their wicked ways and God would have healed their land. Prayer matters. Repentance matters. It really matters to us. You see, the preacher here was struggling with what he saw. Coming judgment. Coming judgment. He's also struggling with the authorities because of what they wanted. They wanted him to stop preaching all of his political themes about repenting and getting on track with God. The nation needed to turn back to God. So here's the point. On this Memorial Day weekend, as we remember the cost of those who risk their lives for our freedom, I would like us also to remember the cost of those who risk their lives for our spiritual freedom. Jesus did. He risked his life for our spiritual freedom. That's what the gospel is all about. But not only him, listen, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 35 through 38, it talks about the men and women of faith. And it says, after going down through all these men and women of faith in this catalog of heroes of faith, it says, others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers, some faced flogging, while still others were chained and put into prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and goatskin, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. And I love this line. The world was not worthy of them. Wow. Listen to me. When you are persecuted for your faith, for the truth, For the plumb line of the word of God, when you are persecuted for that, the world is not worthy of you. God says so. God says so. (laughs) Peter, after being beaten, you know, uh, and he's released, uh, he gets with the, the disciples and he says to the disciples, I thank God that he counted me worthy to suffer shame for his name. You know what he's saying? I'm glad all those politicians didn't like what I was preaching. And it cost me something. I suffered shame for it. I'm proud of that. That's my badge. I'm aligned with those who are people of faith. I will take my stand for the word of God and for Christ. These preachers don't always say what we want them to hear. But they do often say what we need to hear. They did in the Bible times. They do today, today, today as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven,
May we look into the perfect law of liberty and see ourselves as we truly are. May we see the plumb line of your word and see ourselves, and Lord, we will see where we fall short. We are out of line. We are not right. We are not righteous. Lord, that should lead us to confess our sins because you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We are so very thankful for your grace, giving us what we don't deserve, your goodness, your favor, your love. We don't deserve that. There's no amount of obedience that can earn that. Jesus provides it all. But once we come to Jesus as the Savior and Lord, we should obey our Savior. May we not think for one moment we can earn our salvation, but on the other hand, Lord, never forget that you saved us, that we might bear forth fruit, good works, a life that is holy and righteous because you change us from the inside out. Lord, our nation needs a righteous people, a people who pursue holiness and righteousness that we might change the course of the nation. May we be the repentant ones who turn from the wicked ways so you hear our prayer, O God. This I pray in Jesus' name.